I want to click live. Hey, here we are live in the Storycraft Cafe. I am Hank Garner, your host. And with me today, Steve Bollier, uh, one of my longtime friends, one of my, uh, my closest buddies in the writer community. He is a fantastic writer in his own regard and co-owner of Athon Books. So Steve um, is a voice that has a unique perspective in that he is a writer and he's also a publisher of other work and he kind of has uh, an ear to the publishing industry and you know he's constantly watching trends and you know all of this kind of stuff so uh anyway there's been a lot of buzz uh lately about ai and what it is meaning for the technology community and uh, you know, that filters down to the writing community. And right before we left for our Christmas break, um, we at Dabble all started kind of looking at these tools and, you know, what is this going to mean for the the writing and publishing landscape? Um, where should we get involved? What and, and, you know, and just trying to separate what's the reality from the hyperbole and, you know, it's just a lot of information out there. and. Uh, you know, a lot of fun tools to play with, but what does this really mean for the long term? So anyway, welcome to the show, Steve. Well, thank you, Hank. It's, uh, it's been a long time and I'm excited it, to be back. Yeah, it's been like a year since we since yeah. we did this. But um, for, for folks that are not um, familiar with you and your work, um, tell folks who you are and, and what you're up to. Well, I'm sure that's most people on earth uh, <laughs> that are not familiar with uh, I write as Jamie Castle, um, Audible bestseller, number one bestseller, and Washington Post bestseller, a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter to anyone. Um, sold a lot of books in the science fiction fantasy realm. Uh, my biggest series is a weird Western called Black Badge, as well as a sizable epic fantasy series. I've got my hands in a lot of genres, which is um, something I never, ever advise anyone at all. Um, <laughs> but I'm in a unique position, as as Hank has said. Uh, I'm also real name Steve Bollier and co-owner of Athon Books, which is the second largest publisher of science fiction and fantasy on Amazon. Um, and so we've spent the last four years of uh, our life, mine and Rhett C. Bruno, sort of compiling data and um, you know, it sounds a lot more boring than it is, but I, I don't mean we sit around looking at numbers all day, but we see what sells. We see what doesn't sell. Um, we tend to understand why the things sell, why they don't sell. And we become, um, uh, for lack of sounding less arrogant, very knowledgeable in sure. this realm of science fiction and fantasy that doesn't carry over to every other genre. Every genre is different, but sci-fi fantasy We've got our finger on the pulse and we know what's going on. And um, when we first started the Circles channel on um, uh, for the cafe, um, I was very active. I, I tried very hard to stay active, but I've had a hell of a year <laughs> with family and things that I was not expecting. So um, I'm excited to kind of come back and say hi to all of you who I had a, a good relationship there um, on the channel and hope you're watching. Well, we forgive you. Yeah. Um, uh, speaking of the, the cafe site, we've grown to over a thousand members uh, this last year. So lots of great stuff going on there. And if you're just finding us on YouTube uh, or the podcast, if you're listening to the audio that will go out the day after we're recording this, um, go over to storycraft.cafe. It's a, it's a social media site just for writers and that, you know, it needs no other explanation than that. If you need a place to to connect with others and and share ideas, that is the place to do it. Great community. Yeah, um, Steve, you are a um, proponent of co-authoring, Absolutely. and you are probably the biggest proponent of co-authoring that I've ever met. And um, and, and I'm going somewhere with this if, if, uh, if folks are wondering, but um, what is it about combining your voice with another writer? Um, wh what I have noticed, I'll just add this little conjecture is that usually when two writers come together, you have my voice and their voice, but a strange thing happens that you wind up with a third voice. That's 
it, it's more than the sum of its parts. It, I, I don't know what to attribute it to, but you you sometimes wind up with like a, a third character in this writing duo. Uh, have you noticed that? I think I see where you're going with this in the end, and I hate it. But okay. <laughs> uh, but yes, I am a, a huge proponent of of co-authoring. Um, I've done several series with several different authors, and you find out what works, and you find out what doesn't work. Right. Uh, see, Bruno and I write a lot together. We actually write it. We wrote a nonfiction book called Two Authors, One Book. And I think it's subtitled something like, you know, co-authoring murder free or something to that effect, because the reality is if you're not paired well with another individual, it's going to be a catastrophe. Um, I tend to have the voice that ultimately ends these projects because as uh, I started my career as an editor. And so the joy I have in taking what sort of, someone else wrote and reshaping it. It's actually why I'm not an editor anymore because I rewrote a little too much um, <laughs> and took too much time. But you are right. Like a third voice comes out. The works that I did with Rhett versus the works that I did with, say, Chris Vellin or Troy Osgood, like although they all sort of sound like a Jamie Castle project, like there's a, there's a varying degree of difference because you're writing yeah. it with another human being. So it's greater than the sum of his parts. Like you said, you got Troy, you got Jamie, you got Tramey or, you know, uh, <laughs> Droy. I, I don't even know what that would be yeah. the worst celebrity name ever, but uh, right. yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So uh, I talked with, um, with Leanne Leeds last week and she is a paranormal cozy mystery writer uh, who is very vocal about her use of AI tools and what she will do, and and please forgive me, Leanne, if I misrepresent, um, but she will write a section and then have her AI tool read it and offer um, almost like a thesaurus on steroids. Like, um, and, and she used the example that sometimes she could think of only one way to say something. Sure. And she just couldn't think of a better way to phrase this, even though there are a dozen different ways to phrase this one thing. And then she would search through her book and see that she used the same phrase over and over and over because she just couldn't unstick herself. Well, the AI tool could read it and then offer other suggestions. Her same intent, it, the story's still going to the same place that she wanted it to go, just helped her to shape her words a little better. Um, do you think that an AI tool could serve as a co-author and in that it, it brings that other voice and helps to like, like for instance, and, and correct me if I misrepresent the way you do it. If you're writing a book, uh, like your epic fantasy series that you wrote with, with Rhett and you write a passage and then Rhett comes in and like we've talked about in the past year, the onion method of adding layers to that story. Um, could an AI do the same thing that you and Rhett are doing? Well, it sounds to me like Leanne's figured that out to some extent, right? The, the beauty yeah. of AI. Now, let me preface this. I'm not a fan of all AI, okay? I'm a science fiction writer, and I don't think any human being will ever go wrong <laughs> siding with humans over machines. I'm just saying, we've all seen the movies. We've all read yep. the books. Uh, this doesn't end well if it's not properly nurtured and cared for. Right. Um, that said, we've been using AI for a long time, and we just never quite called it AI, right? You've got, you've, you've had word offering suggestions as you write with little ugly squiggly lines yep. for the last 10 years. That's and AI. Grammarly and pro writing grammarly, aid. Pro aid, right? You've got all of these things. I use Grammarly all the time. When I'm finished writing a book, after I've done my human editing passes, after I've done all of that, I take them chapter by chapter into Grammarly and do something similar to what Leanne is talking about. I will take a word. If I see a word used several times, if I see the word shot, right? Like I'm writing Westerns. If I see the word shot over and over again, I need to constantly try to figure out how to reword these things. And sometimes you double click, you get a good suggestion. Sometimes the AI suggests some good things. Sometimes it doesn't. And you've just got to right. buckle down and figure out how do I word this so it doesn't sound like I'm repeating myself 
constantly. But if an AI has the means of taking what you have written, spicing it up, making it better, I see the I see the value in that. The opposite end of this coin is that we're always going to be struggling with the battle between human and machine. Right. The argument can be made, that's what an editor is for. And you're taking the job of an editor and reducing it to that of a machine. But there's no putting this cat back in the bag. It's out. And we need to find ways of using it. Like, for instance, I'm entirely against AI art for book covers. I have made a firm stance with Athon that we will not use AI art knowingly for our book covers. Because I believe in keeping human artists feeding their families. Of course. Um, I, I'll say this. I don't know what 20 years from now is going to look like. I have no idea. I can't make uh, general statements about what we're going to do for the remainder of our lifetime. But like right now, uh, for the foreseeable future, I don't intend to use AI art. But like if all the artists disappear, which I've lost several artists to depression because mm. of the AI art. Like this isn't even like, I'm even telling them, Hey, I'm still using you and I'll still pay you money. And they're like, no, I'm done. There's no need for me anymore. I'm out. Wow. So what this has done to the community at large, you've got authors who are genuinely worried that they're going to lose their careers, but I've used chat GPT to see what it looks like. And it puts out a bunch of crap. <laughs> it doesn't put out good words. It puts out words. Yeah. So if you're talking about using an app like that as a co-author, here's what I can see. I've created an outline for my book and I can take those paragraphs for each chapter, put them into an AI, have them spit out something recognizable as a story that really to me just creates a deeper outline for me to go through and, and do that. Now, I don't do that and I don't plan to do that, but I know authors that do that. And if that's helpful... Um, so be it at the end of the day, this is a business and, right. um, most authors are honest about the fact that the, the age of writing, cause you love writing is gone. <laughs> um, sure. We still love it, but the only way to pay bills is to pay bills. So I hate it. Um, but that's what works. That's what works. I have a couple of thoughts about what you said. Um, the over the the Christmas break, I was playing with with Chat GPT and just trying to figure out what what all the hype was about. And so, um, I have a book that uh, that I wrote and am currently um, uh, second drafting right now. And um, and I said, I went to Chat GPT and I said, write. Um, a murder mystery set in a small southern town, and your protagonist is named this, and he has a love interest named this, and there are four suspects. One of them is the actual murder, and and I gave it some pretty detailed um, parameters, and I said it, it's going to be an eighty thousand word novel, so give me a um, a forty chapter outline for this book, and it spit out a a decent outline now now one i gave it a lot of very specific parameters to work with um so i had done some of the thinking for it you know so that's the human aspect that comes into it um and it, it was a, a a pretty basic three-act structure and it was there was a lot of repetitive stuff in the in the outline um but it it did kind of trigger a couple of ideas that I had not thought of, um, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was probably 60% usable and I still had to put about 40% in to, to make this a workable, workable outline. Um, so to me, the more you use it and the more that it spits out and then you hone that and you, you keep kind of shaping it, it, it can deliver something usable, but you still have to have that human input. It's it's not just going to do it on its own. You can't just say, give me a, a 40 chapter outline for an 80,000 word murder mystery. And it, and it be good because it's just not going to be. And, and AI is sort of limited to word count still at this point. Right. Um, that'll change. But what's interesting. So I used to be a pastor, uh, you know that, but the audience does not know. Yeah. Um, 
this this whole thing has sparked this really interesting thought process in my head versus you know intelligent design versus right. natural right like there's actually some really crazy parallels here that there's always going to be a human intelligence necessary whether you agree with intelligent design or not put that aside for a second what i'm yeah. trying to say is that this is showing us that although this ai has the ability to create something whether it be art or or written word without that human element of saying here's what i need you to do it's still not there it's not going to just start painting leonardo right. da vinci uh style paintings by itself uh, it's, it's all comes down to, and I think that's what a lot of the AI art community is arguing about. That's called synth synthography. Um, a lot of it comes down to your ability to guide something like mid journey, the words that you put in the codes that you put in those ultimately develop what the end product is. And like you said, with chat GPT, you had to give it some parameters to follow. Right. Um, I don't see myself using it because honestly, it sounds like more work to me than actually just writing a book. Um, I write fast and yeah. write fast. It might be a totally different thing. If you're somebody who struggles to write a book, maybe it takes you three years to write a book or something like that. I could see this being really great for brainstorming. I could see it being really great for helping with outlines and helping understand story because it's got a lot of stories over the course of the right. internet to pull from, um, which is a danger in itself, but we could probably do a whole section on the yeah. dangers of AI pulling something copyright infringement that you're not aware of. <laughs> One one question or one observation that I that I had yesterday, we we were uh, a bunch of us were talking about this, um, and uh, I said if if Chat GPT is being educated by the internet, and and someone posted a uh, an article saying that in in a few years ninety percent of the content on the internet will be AI generated, and and the AI is learning from what it's reading on the internet. At what point will it just become self-referential and and not be any good anymore? Um, you know that th that just seems like a kind of self-defeating proposition to me. Here's the cyberpunk danger: once it overwhelms itself, right, and there's no longer human input. Uh, I mean, how many of us are suffering from not knowing whether we could believe a news article, right? Whether, regardless of the side of the aisle you're on, there's always the question of, okay, how much of this is um, opinion or how much of this is twisted fact? And the more I think we get to regurgitated AI information, I think the more that's going to happen because right. like you said, it's, it's, it's regurgitated. It's just, I can't remember the term you use, but self. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, self-referential. Yeah, self-referential. And the yeah. human element of the internet, I think, is what keeps most of us on the internet. I'm not on the internet for a whole lot other than to keep in contact with people in on social media that I, I don't know, went to third grade with. And I don't really care necessarily deeply about what they're going through in life. But at the same time, it's kind of fun and cool to see what this dude I went to third grade with has turned out to be. Right. Without that element, I don't see much need for hanging out on the internet other than to find out where the best place to bury a body is so that as I'm writing my book, <laughs> the FBI can be all over me. Exactly. Know? Exactly. So um, ha have you encountered, uh, like in your business, in, in Athon books specifically, ha has this come up? Has uh, Other than the, the artwork, uh, artwork discussion. Artwork has been big, right? Artwork, even authors... Sometimes authors come to us with their own artwork as sort of part of the package. We don't do that often, but like if somebody delivers, Hey, here's book one. And I already got, um, I already got a book cover for it. They turn it in. I'm like, Oh, that's really fantastic. And then I look at it and go, this is it. This is mid journey. And then I'll say, Hey, was this AI? Yes, it was cool. We can't use that. Um, that's a thing I'm worried about the day when somebody submits to me, a book that's totally AI, and this is to this is down the, the the ways a bit, where maybe it'll become less uh, evident that it's AI. But here's the thing that we still have going for us as humans: 
is that I'll use artwork as the example, but this applies, I think, to novel writing. Um, AI is terrible at replication. So say I want a book cover of Hank Garner with a gun in a city. It's very bad at replicating the same thing twice or three times. So to have a series of artwork that all looks like that right. character and that whatever, that's difficult. So when it comes to writing books, it's going to become exponentially more difficult for the AI to remember the things that that character did in, say, book one versus book two. Will we get there? Probably. I don't know. Um, but I'm... I, that's that's where we're that's the struggle I think we're facing now is you really need the human element to keep that world Bible to know what's going on so that you can make the changes necessary. Well, and um, if, if you just using my example of creating the outline that I was talking about that that I had to give it a lot of input. Um, so it, at what point? can you say the story is AI generated if I'm giving it so much input? Like, do we see this as becoming uh, an entity that could come up with all of the varied details that we need um, just all on its own? Um, I, I, I don't know. Like, how do you split out what, uh, what value the human input was versus what value the, the AI is bringing. That. Well, I've read, I've read like AI written things. I've read, um, it's lacking the emotion a, a lot that we, right. You know, right. Like you get the story and it's mostly exposition and where does this dialogue come in? And, and I get it. There's probably people, Leanne might be way better at input to get the things out of it that it needs. But I think that we're a long ways off from not having human input. Um, right. I think this is a book farmer's dream. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot. There's going to be an influx of crap that hits Amazon. Now, if you're doing this already and you're good at it, don't take that as an implication against you. What I'm saying is that people who don't care about being good at it, who are really only caring about providing content to boost their overall productivity, um, this is going to become an issue because when the indie community started up on Amazon, uh, things were going well. And then there became this hard cut between trad and indie. And you've got people who will only read indie, people who will only read trad. And they go to extreme lanes to make sure that they're only reading one or the other. And one side said, well, this one's better. One side says, well, this one's better. And there was a, there was a quality issue between trad and indie. The quality issue comes from a lot of the fact that trad just goes through so many human editors um, before it hits the shelves and indies usually have an editor and maybe some beta readers. And so um, there's still this confusion in the community about like, well, why does this have so many typos? Because it doesn't go through seven people and we don't spend $500,000 on a book. Inflated numbers, exaggerations, but like that's, so we're going to see the AI books come out in droves. And I think people are going to immediately recognize them as AI. Some people won't care. Well, and and you and I have both been around um, the publishing industry for for a little better than a decade. And in that time, um, I have seen a number of waves of of gimmicks and things. You know, when when Kindle Unlimited first came out, you had people that you know when they were paying a certain amount for finished book you had people that would copy a wikipedia article and upload that as an ebook and then you know two page clicks you're done you get paid you know and then you had all these people you can make money on kindle by doing this and and you know then and then amazon comes in and they fix that and then the next you know those things kind of fall off and the next wave of of the the kindle gold rush you know people and there, there will always be these influxes of people that are trying to game the system, uh, but invariably they all filter out over time because e either people become aware of what they're doing and wary, or um, they get shunned, wh whatever the reason, or it just stops working. So I think naturally we're going to have an influx of these things coming, but will they 
kind of filter themselves out and and I, I guess the 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 purchasing um population will ultimately be the the guardians of that stuff do, do you see do you yeah. think people will will make a determination i'm not going to read this because it's obviously you know just drivel thought up by an ai like where does the human factor come in i think it depends how good ai gets right if good yeah. if ai gets good enough to take my job um, then I can go be a greeter at Walmart and uh, still have a smile on my face all day long. Right. Um, but there's going to be a lot of people who can't find joy in life uh, without doing what they're currently doing. So I think it'll have a great impact on the author community. And I think because of that, it'll have a great impact on the reader community. Uh, I don't think the quality of AI in, our, in, in the next 10 years is going to exceed that of the best writers. Um, Somebody did comment in the chat here, Amazon might start mandating labels of all AI books. That's fine. But you know what? That's only as as helpful as people are honest. And right. we've seen a tremendous number of dishonest people over the course of these last 10, 15 years in the indie community. Um, by and large, I love the indie community. I'm part of it. And I love the, the majority of writers that are a part of this thing, whether I agree with the things they do or not. But... When someone starts literally stealing out of my pocket, which is what it is when you are gaming the KU community, don't ever misunderstand this. If somebody is cheating the system to make money on KU, you're losing money. Right. Because it's a pot that is right. that divided amongst all the authors in there. And if one person is dishonestly making more of that pot, you're being stolen from. Yeah. That's right. very important to remember. And I think a lot of authors don't get that element. They just think they get paid per page read. You get paid depending on how many page reads there are within that pot and how many authors are taken from that pot. So we have to be a little more um, assertive when it comes to somebody spouting the, the ways they've found to make money on KU. Because when we want to do it honestly, um, we're taking the risk of making less money than somebody who's willing to do things dishonestly. And Amazon is not the best um, policing agency on the planet. I've known many friends who have lost their accounts for no good reason. And then there's no recourse for that. And I've had friends that are still doing bull crap and <laughs> they don't get called out on it. Right. Um, so don't rely on Amazon. Amazon is the, is the cyberpunk corporation that has taken over the world. And we're still fighting it, but like <laughs> it's it's done, it's over, man. The, the, well, the fat lady saying, "Well, I, I think Ku is being policed by an AI that's not quite got enough information yet." Yeah, I mean, we've got a lot of human contacts at um, at Amazon, but what ends up happening is you sort of file your complaint, you get this canned response, and then we go, "No, no, let's talk to a person." Right? We have enough clout on Amazon. Uh, as Athon to be able to actually get somewhere, but most authors don't have that. Most authors just deal with the form letter that says your account has been terminated. Good luck. Yeah. And it sucks, but it's real. Yeah. Um, you're you're constantly getting submissions from authors. Um, you know, aside from AI doing the work. Uh, of writing, do you see any trends in the types of stories that are coming out where AI is a topic of conversation? You know, science fiction has always been really great about um, looking at society and giving us um, the the truth of our reality through a different lens, kind of the the lie that tells the truth, if you will. Um, do you see uh, any stories coming out? that are, you know, raising the red flags for us or, uh, you know, just from, from that perspective, are you, are you seeing anything or sensing anything in the industry? Um, I mean, we've had the Skynet since the eighties, right? We've right. had the idea of the Terminator and all of that stuff since the eighties. We've got, we've got one author, Craig Martell, who, um, he's really big on writing good AI, um, you've got AI in, um, Craig Allenson's, uh, expeditionary force who, who's a beer can, right? Like you've got <laughs> who's comic relief 
Yeah. And, you know, what I find funny about Craig's books is that um, it's always the human. It's always the stupid monkey, as right. he puts it, that figures out what the AI couldn't figure out how to do. It's 15 books of Skippy going, Joe, you stupid monkey. How'd you figure that out when I couldn't? And it's entertaining and it's comedic right. and whatever. But uh, I don't think really we have a full grasp on what this AI thing has the capabilities of doing because we could tell all the horror stories, but yeah. we, might not, we might never get Borg. We might never get Terminators. Um, I, I don't, I don't really know if, if AI is capable of becoming self aware to a degree where it goes, humanity is lost. Let's get rid of it. Um, I don't know. I don't want to find out, <laughs> but uh, I tend to think that for the next five years or so, we're going to find some really uh, applicable reasons to use AI. And I'm not necessarily talking about to take over our jobs, but to make our jobs easier. Yeah. yeah. There are elements that I'm seeing right now that really concern me. And that a lot of that is in the narration world, audiobook narration, right? We've got a good mm -hmm. friend of mine, one of my narrators, Ray Porter, yeah, who has licensed his voice to, to Apple. So there's a now an AI character named Mitchell who sounds exactly like Ray Porter. So mm. uh, with respect to Ray, if Ray ever sees this, hears about this, Ray, I yeah. love you. And this has, this is not a negative right. statement for you, but what we're going to end but up. It's something we need to be aware of. Yeah. What we'll end up seeing is a bunch of uh, subpar books narrated by Ray Porter, but not really narrated by Ray Porter. And, you know, Ray has always been good at, at picking his projects. And, right. you know, uh, we saw James Earl Jones. James Earl Jones uh, licensed his voice to Disney forever because we needed Darth Vader to continue. And so, like, those are areas where I think this is really awesome. We will never lose the voice of Darth Vader. The acting community might go, yeah, but that was my chance. I could have been Darth Vader. But, but, I mean, that's it. That's all I got is just right. like, just a big butt there. What do you, um, that, that, that was, that's an aspect that I've not, um, put much thought into the, the AI of, of audio creation. Um, wow. Yeah. That, that's gonna, that's gonna be an issue. Julia Wellen did the same thing. She, they both at the same time licensed their voices and, um, God, I feel like I need to continually disclaimer this. Like, this is not me casting judgment. This is me just saying, here's sure. where we're going. Right. And right. a buddy of mine actually sent me a, just, just two days ago, we've never had a conversation about AI at all. And he sent me, um, he said, I'm doing an audio book with Snoop Dogg right now. And now this guy, I actually believe that could have been true. Yeah. Um, but then he sends me the video and it's Snoop Dogg reading, um, there's this uh, this old preacher who who had this. Uh, he's the king of kings. He's the lord of lords. Yeah, I know, I know the know him, right? Like there's that famous. Yeah. Do you know him, and it's Snoop Dogg reading that. And I went, okay, why would Snoop Dogg be reading this? And then I listened a little closer, and I saw there's really no good inflections. Um, it's and, not quite understanding the tone of the passage. Right. So although it sounds human, and it sounds like Snoop Dogg. He doesn't understand that AI does not understand the it, the gravity of what he's reading. Right, and and that has always been the issue with with text to speech. And, and as a matter of fact, in Dabble, we have a, a a tool there that will read the passage that you've just written to you, and as a huge benefit for getting to switch gears from reading the words to hearing the words, because there's a lot of times you can pick up dialogue things it's very very helpful but it's not it's not gonna you can't narrate an audiobook with it because of the exact point that you just brought up the inflections the interpreting emotions uh ai just can't do that or it hasn't been able to do hasn't that yet. yet there's a lot of authors that like nick thacker a uh, big advocate yeah. of of narration audiobook narration uh, ai you know he sort of is an advocate that 80 percent is okay and, well, and 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 will we find a point where people have a level that they're just okay with and and you know will does that does that by definition create a niche where where human 
and, and maybe this is with AI created stories as well, where you can have a story or you can have uh, a niche that a, a more costly book that is hu- that, that is a human creation. Like, do we, are we creating a niche for humans in, in there's this? There's going to be this weird divide, right? There's going yeah. to be there, there. First of all, there's going to be a, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Hank. You were no, no, I, I was just going to, I was just going to qualify with, um, I used to work for um, PV electronics, the, the music manufacturer. And when, when everything was going to China, um, there came a point where um, the company had a decision. We can either just, you know, move all of our manufacturing to China and then we are uh, just joining the race to the bottom, you know, for, for the cheapest product, or we can take these handcrafted products and we can become uh, a niche manufacturer um, that, that is, you know, hand built, you know, and, and then that becomes another thing. And well, they, um, they chose to go the China route, but that's, that's, you know, neither here nor there. Um, but you know there there's a it just dis, the market distinguishes itself by the the people that put the craft and care into something versus the mass produced thing. Yeah. So are we going to see a divide like that in in the author community? Um, I think that there's a far greater connection that is created from audiobooks than many people who even have these connections are not, are not getting quite yet. Let me qualify that. Okay. RC Bray, one of the greatest narrators of our time, one of the most loved Bob Bray is one of my favorite people. Um, I, you know, I can listen to him. Um, any conversations I have with him, they're always great. Right. Like, but the connection to Bob for his readers is, is almost idolatrous, right? Like, they are so infatuated and in love with Bob that if you take his voice and you license it, they're not necessarily going to be as excited about listening to an AI performed book with his voice as they would a book that they knew he performed because there's a connection that's made. We right. know that our favorite narrator sat in a booth for 20 hours to produce this 12 hour long book and their blood, sweat and tears went into it. And it's almost as if they're reading it directly to us. There, there's a million people listening to uh, Titanborn by Red C. Bruno. But of those million people, Bob was reading it to me. And I experienced it as if I was being read to around a campfire. Um, Roger Clark's performance of the Black Badge series, like... It is like Roger Clark, Arthur Morgan from Red Dead Redemption 2 is sitting at a campfire telling me a story. If that was done by AI, that connection's gone. Right. Entirely gone. That's and why people weirdly enjoy when a, when an author reads their own book. Sometimes that is phenomenal. Christopher, uh, I can't remember his last name, but he wrote The Black Tongue Thief. One of the best performances I've ever heard in my life. And then I find out, oh, the, the author did this. And well, it's, it's stellar. It, it's interesting because, like you said, if, if Bob Bray were to license his voice, um, you would get the, 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 the timbre of his voice, um, but not the spirit of his voice. Would be able to make the decisions. Yeah, th- there's something about the the infusion of the human spirit that that is just lacking, and un- until AI can do that, um, you know. Ray did Luna Missile Crisis, one of my right. books, one of mine and rest books. Okay, so Ray has a plethora of voices that he does. For Shimmer, he did this phenomenal alien voice. For the females, he's got his own great sounding female voice. I think he's one of the best in the in the business in terms of that. Um, unless I don't know something, unless Apple has this like way of saying, this is the voice, right? Maybe Ray, uh, maybe he did a million voices. I really don't know. But at some point, the performance of a book comes down to the choices that the narrator made, good or bad. And where is that going to be in the AI world? We're, we're years away from that, I think, unless I'm an idiot and they've already done it and I just haven't heard it yet. Yeah. 
Um, Kit had a, a, a great comment, some historical parallels, photography versus painters, mass manufactured clothing versus tailors, um, all of those uh, valid. Uh, I remember, Steve, when Photoshop first came mm-hmm. out and when it really became viable. It, it had been around for a decade before it, it really became a thing. Um, and uh, And there came a point where photos could be manipulated photos could be created from from thin air um and there was a lot of discussion about what is this going to do for the for the art community and um and things changed um but things became different they stayed the um, same they really they, they changed but it stayed the same right right i've heard the argument about especially in the art side of things well what about when photo manipulation became a thing the entire community thought but even in book covers, for instance, you've got your niches that enjoy the photo bash, and then mm-hmm. you've got the illustration niches. Um, those don't cross over a whole lot. Uh, you've got your paranormal urban fantasy that are generally real people, and it's the same dude on the cover of every friggin' book, right? Like you've got the same dude's bare chest and nipples on every romance book ever. <laughs> um, and then when you get into the fantasy and science fiction realm, it's generally illustrated stuff. Uh, I'll make this argument. Mid journey can do sh- spaceships better than any artist I've used. And I've used some of the best, right? Tom Edwards is fantastic. Philip Daniels is fantastic and they do an amazing job, but like mid journey has some incredible space scenes that would take these guys weeks to do, but that doesn't change the fact that for me, at least a slightly better cover or even a wildly better cover is not worth me saying this guy shouldn't work right now. Right. If I could afford it, which I can, not everyone can, I'm not going to make arguments for somebody who can't afford it because $8 a month for mid journey, it it beats a thousand dollars a cover any day of the week. I'm not going to make that argument, but like I can afford it. So I'm going to keep these artists living. I don't see the parallel between photography and, and painting. I know at some point in time, that was a huge deal. We're talking about something that requires very little human involvement at all. You learn key phrases, you learn how to tell it what you want, and it spits out an image. And that image is gorgeous and usable. And it's creating something in 30 seconds that photography, you still need the skill of using the camera. My wife is a phenomenal photographer. She did wedding photography for years. Give me the same camera. I'll give you shit. It's not going to look anything remotely like what my wife took. Right. There's a skill involved. And you'll argue that there's a skill involved in synthography. You have to have the right words and phrases, but like I can take literally a copy and paste of what my buddy Chris does with that. I'll just copy and paste what he did. It's going to give me something just as good as what he did. There's eventually going to be websites that just give you uh, like lists of things to tell AI and then you'll just change out a word here or there and you've done nothing. Somebody did all that work for you. Yeah. It's not the same thing, although I understand the parallel and I appreciate the parallel. I just sure. don't see it remotely close to the same thing. Yeah. So we have identified uh, things that are um, overhyped. Um, things that might be worth uh, being wary of in the future. Where do you see AI as being helpful to authors right now with, with the way the tools are and how can someone say, I I still want to tell the best story I can, but uh, you know what? I want to use this because it's, it's a, it's another tool I can add to my toolbox. Yeah, I, I think that we've talked a little bit about that. I, I mean, e- even just before I full on answer that question, I was thought I, I was reminded of um, an app that a lot of narrators use and have gotten a lot of crap for using. And I can't remember the name of it. It starts with a P, um, but it, it, it proofreads their performances versus the manuscript. And it pulls out anytime they said something that was different from what was written in the text. And narrators are very hesitant to admit they use this because it's taking money from proofreaders. At some point, though, we saw the $4,000 um, 
indie book editor realize that that's no longer of value to an author. So now they're doing the same job for a fraction of that because the industry changes. And until mm -hmm. narration becomes cheaper and still until pr proofreading becomes cheaper, until artists become cheaper, there's going to be a group of people, authors that can't afford to do that, who still want to be a part of the author community. So like you almost have to look at this in class systems and I hate to say it that way, but like you have to look at people who could afford this, people who could afford this, people who could afford this and go, okay, how are they beneficial to each one of those groups? And those who are at the top who can afford everything are always going to look down on those who can't afford everything because that's just the way society goes. But you've got to make a decision for yourself. What is it good for? It's great for editing. Grammarly and ProAid, ProWriter Aid are so good for a pre-editor for me, a pre-human editor pass. I want to save my editor as much time as possible by catching as many things as I can before they have to, because as my editor contract used to say, I am responsible for a finite number of your potentially infinite mistakes. <laughs> it's a legit like nest because like you'd have authors who get pissed off that there's 10 typos left in your book. Well, you had 30,000 typos in a hundred thousand word book. And I caught 29,970 of them. And right. sorry, some got through. Um, so for editing, that's great for helping with brainstorming. Um, what I thought was fun when I did the chat GPT thing is I said something like uh two science, uh, two, two um, science fiction, futuristic Marines infiltrate an enemy's uh, whatever I called it base to retrieve sensitive documents. Right. And it spit out something 600 words that I went, it's not good, but yeah. it gave me some thoughts and some ideas. Right. Brainstorm. Like if you don't have a human being to brainstorm, that's why I'm a, a proponent of co-writing. Cause I think you, if you have a good co-writer, you get a doubly better product yeah because my stupid ideas go to red and a human being goes that's a stupid idea <laughs> but there's an idea there yeah here's a better idea here's how yeah. to refine your idea and right. so if ai could be used to refine your your poop into gold or your coal yeah. into diamond or however you want to word it does poop turn to gold that'd be amazing yeah. um i think it's useful there i think it's useful for um in writing what you're talking about with dabble to be able to read back what you wrote because as most narrators will tell you the best way to find typos is to read it out loud right and your brain as you're reading if you don't know this your brain figures out what you were trying to say even yeah. if it's wrong right like he went to the store might actually say he went the to store but your brain goes nope it says it right. What's the what's the statistic that once you have read uh, over a typo three times, I, I think it's three times, then your brain just will yeah will just overlook it and you'll 100%. never see it after that. And so I read every book I've ever written out loud, and there's still typos. <laughs> like I, I feel like an idiot sometimes. My wife will text me from downstairs, "Who are you talking to?" And when I do it, a black badge, I, I read like Roger Clark. I know how Roger Clark's voice sounds. So I want to get all of the inflections like he would get them. So I'll change words around to make it work for Roger. And uh, she'll hear me screaming like a cowboy. And she's like, who are you talking to? <laughs> and I'll say, I'm reading. I'm reading one of my books out loud. And I feel like an idiot. But um, so having Dabble be able to read it back to you. So that you can hear when that AI clearly, because the AI, listen, AIs are rough still in a lot of ways. Yeah. And so when they make a mistake, that mistake is jarring. Yeah. Um, it's your mistake. But if when they read a mistake, it's jarring is what I should yeah. say. Well, where I have found um, helpful is not necessarily taking my words and feeding them into it, but it, brainstorming. Um, let the, the AI come up with an idea that I haven't had yet. And then me refine its Absolutely. idea instead of it, instead of it refining my ideas where I found it useful is to just give me an idea that I've not thought of. And then, and then my imagination takes over and that's where I found it helpful. So far. 
you know what the hardest thing for some fantasy writers is to do is uh is to write Imagine names with 37 consonants. Yes, but uh, that's a different subject altogether. Make your freaking characters readable because nobody wants to. I don't know what an apostrophe is supposed to sound like. So, um, but we write 37 fight scenes in a book and you can only slash and parry and dodge so many times. But if you were to pump that into an AI and say such and such fights such and such with this weapon and that weapon and take what that AI has created. And they're gonna they're gonna show a fight scene differently than you're gonna show a fight scene. Take that, refine it to sound like your voice, and now right. you've got moves that you may not have come up with on your own that are potentially better than something you've you would have come up with, or maybe you already used it in the book. You've got something new now. Those are areas I think it's highly beneficial. I haven't thought of that, but you're absolutely right. That that would be a great use for that. Chasing uh, anything that gets repetitive, right? It's man, being an author is hard. You come, you have, yeah. you, you can't, you can't come up with so many different ways of. It's, I think that's what Leanne was really getting at. In that is like, yeah. it doesn't matter how good a writer you are, you eventually run out of words. Right, right, and 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 I think her her whole point was um, she had the intention already. And she just n- uses it to help refine her intention. It, yep. Not that she's depending on it to come up with her intentions, but it she already has it slated out. Help me say it better. Okay. And I think that's a that's a wonderful use for it. And you're editing your own her for, and you find a sentence that just sucks, and you can't yeah. find a better way of saying it. You put that in an AI, and you say rewrite this sentence. Yeah, that's a whole lot easier than spending the next four minutes five minutes, 10 minutes trying to rewrite one sentence when your time can better be used going on to the next sentence. Exactly. Exactly. Well, whether, no matter how we feel about it, um, AI is, is here or it's coming. Um, and it's something we're going to have to deal with. And, uh, if we can find ways to, uh, to make our author life more enjoyable, uh, more, more creative because of it, then I think that's wonderful. Um, And with everything, there's always going to be downsides. There's going to be people that try to use it to game the system and all that, but, but that's going to be, that's not the technology's fault. That's, you know, crappy human beings. And I read that meme I sent you earlier. Yes. All right. So I sent Hank this meme because I knew we were talking about this, but Hank meme, Hank and I meme each other all the time. Yeah. Uh, 1960s futurists. Automation will free mankind from media, meaningless tedium to focus on creative pursuits only human beings can master. 2020s tech bros. We're building AI to write all your books, music, and TV so you could focus on the meaningless tedium of your cubicle job. <laughs> <laughs> It's sad. It is sad. And, and humans, um, just for, for whatever reason, we just love to be cyclical and, and to, to fight the same battles over and over. And the weapons just seem to get different. And I think that's where we are now. Um, Steve, I don't know that we solved anything today, but at least we aired our grievances. Yep. <laughs> Best of us for the rest of us. That's right. What uh, what you got new on the horizon? What What's coming up? What are you excited about? Uh, 2023 is going to be interesting. Um, I told you I had a really rough year last year, but I, I completed, I think, seven books. Um, awesome. And I'll remind everyone that I do have co-authors, so I work. Although I touch every word, although I write every word, I don't write every word, if you understand yeah. what I mean, right? I'll do a chapter. They'll do a chapter. I'll do it. So it's, it's a little easier to finish as many books. So don't feel that need to like compete. Uh, everyone's got different processes, but, um, next year I've got vain pursuits, which is black badge book two coming out in May. Um, I've got a brand new series with Andy Pelliquin called the dragon blood assassin. That's starting. That's going to be narrated by, um, Michael Kramer and Kate Redding. Nice. So I'm really excited about those. Those books are just continually getting bigger, man. Andy and I don't know how to write short. And I think book <laughs> two was like 200,000 or 200 and something thousand words. And book three, we're going to have to split because we don't have 
we can't do 400,000 word books, even though he does. Um, I've got a, a military sci-fi series coming out. That's uh, that's just me, just Jamie Castle called um, Rogue Stars. I've got three books in the Raptors series, um, basically books five, six, and, or four, five, and six, but we're renaming it. It's Harrier book one through three. So if you are a fan of Raptors, um, the story's continuing, just looking a little different in terms of, of branding. And then um, I've got a middle grade book that I started writing in 2016. It was a NaNoWriMo project in 2016 nice. that I just ignored for however many years this has been. And just over the past couple of months, I finally finished it. And um, I've got my agent shopping it because I have no idea how to sell middle grade books. Um, <laughs> uh, it might be it. There might be more, but there's probably about six or seven books coming out in 2023 that I've been kind of sitting on. So awesome. A lot of stuff. Um, your website is Athon. Uh, is that the, the best place? Athonbooks.com, A E T H O N books.com. Um, we publish about 200 books a year in the science fiction fantasy world. And then if you're interested in my books, jamiecastle.com, J A I M E castle.com. Excellent. We'll link all that up in the show notes. Steve, always a pleasure to hang out. Thanks for uh, coming in and just spitballing the topic with me. Thanks for having me.